Welcome to the Athlete's First Performance Podcast, where two performance-minded physical therapists break down the evidence to improve overall health, movement, and performance for athletes and active individuals. All right, welcome to episode six of the Athlete's First Performance Podcast. Today we have another guest, Maddie Franick, um, and we're going to be talking about ACL rehab after that first six weeks. Um, how's everything going, Maddie? It's going good. It's going good. You know, clinic is kind of ramping up right now. It's kind of getting a little, you know, a little hectic going from like 75% to being booked out for weeks. So that's a little bit of an adjustment period, but uh, it's all good. You know, it's just getting back in the swing of things. Um, you know, hopefully kind of getting some, some more patients to the door as kind of the numbers, you know, COVID and stuff starts getting, you know, better under control. So um, it's, it's, it's getting busy, but it's good. Do you want to go ahead and uh, give us a little introduction, Maddie? Sure. I'll make this a nice short and brief so you guys don't have to, you know, listen to me talk too much about it. But um, so, yeah, my name is Maddie Franick. I'm from originally from from Florida, um, from the kind of Bradenton, Sarasota area. Um, I did my undergrad at the University of South Florida um, in exercise science. Um, When I was done with there, I came up to North Carolina and I went to, to Duke University, um, graduated from Duke in 2018. Um, so I've been practicing for almost three years now. Um, after Duke was done, um, decided to kind of go with some continued training, um, actually James, um, with the Institute for Athlete Regeneration, uh, where we were there for a year and got uh, certified in sports and orthopedic uh, manual therapy. Um, and was kind of thinking about the idea of kind of going through um, a manual fellowship, but it just at, at this point in time, um, just with some some family decisions and things, you know, we decided it was best just to kind of take a break from that um, and just kind of stay in clinical practice right now. So um, my role as a full time clinical therapist, um, but also trying right now to to kind of get my hands wet a little bit in, in the research side of things and, and potentially some some teaching as well. So um, just hopefully some some opportunities will. We'll come forward, um, you know, particularly in this, this area of kind of ACL reconstruction and also have a very um, kind of passion or a lot of passion behind the development of post-traumatic osteoarthritis. So um, it's, uh, it's kind of a, a new topic, I should say, you know, a more published recently topic. But I think um, it's really interesting looking, looking at the thought process of not only you know, someone at say nine to 12 months of the, um, you know, post-surgery, but it's also looking at the, the continuum of care and the quality of life. Um, you know, the thought process of, you know, someone 16 or 17 to tailor ACL and, you know, by, by the time they're, you know, 35, 36, right. Um, and, and that kind of second decade after, after ACLR, you know, we're talking about a coin flip of, of whether or not someone's having osteoarthritis. And so, um, I think it's interesting this idea of trying to figure out how can we potentially optimize the rehab process a little bit better. Um, to not only set some up for optimizing return of performance, but also, you know, 20, 30 years down the road in terms of trying to mitigate the risk of, you know, like a knee replacement or something like that. So um, that's kind of an area that's been a new passion for mine recently, but it's been, been an interest as well. Yeah, that's a super important topic because we know in the research that, like you said, there's a huge incidence of OA after ACL reconstruction. So that's definitely something that we need to get better at in terms of physical therapy and helping and trying to prevent that. Mm-hmm. Um, so in terms of what we're talking about today, more towards that end stage rehab, how did you first get introduced to the control chaos continuum? Yeah, so um, actually back back in November, we had a, we had a little bit of a, a COVID event situation in our household. And uh, I was, I was forced to kind of take some time off from, from work because of uh, protocols and stuff like that. But it actually turned, turned out to be pretty good because I was able to use that time um, to kind of dive into this protocol a little bit more. Um, I was somewhat familiar with uh, Bucktorp's model. Um, I'd seen it in the past, um, you know, and I had wanted to get to it, but I never kind of got to it. And I was like, you know, I'm going to use the time to kind of sit down. I don't really know. I, I'd seen um, Tabiner's model as well, um, you know, through, I think it was um, initially – through the, through the Aspitar journal, Aspitar had a, had a really good series. Um, I think it was last year sometime um, about ACL reconstruction. And I saw the model initially proposed in there. And I remember looking at it the first time and being like, what in the world is, is going on here with all the, all the numbers and all, all the metrics. And I was like, what is going on? So I think I just kind of put it aside and was like, this is not clinically relevant for me. 
Um, but then I went back and I looked into a little bit more and I was like, you know, as, as I dissected some of the, some of the data, um, you know, from a testing standpoint, but also from a metric standpoint, it started to kind of make sense a little bit more. And so, um, ever since, yeah, like November, December time, um, I've been just kind of playing with it. Um, I tried to, tried to take the model cause obviously it's been designed for the elite level athlete. So mm-hmm. the problem with that is sometimes it can not have, um, as much clinical applicability within the, you know, traditional outpatient orthopedic and sports medicine setting. So one thing I tried to do was I tried to take some of the metrics that they were using. And then I tried to take some normative based data, say within like a, a youth female soccer player in terms of, you know, what was the, um, the amount of you know, meters they were covering within a game or kind of high speed run distance or max, max sprint distance. And I tried to take some of that data and use some of the same kind of, um, uh, ratios that they used at various stages. Um, and I tried to apply it. So, um, I've done that with a little bit of success, not actually with an implementation within the clinical aspect, but just from a, from a theoretical standpoint. Um, and it's been trying to take some of those same ideas and trying to find normative data as it pertains to like other sports. So, you know, male soccer or, you know, men's basketball or things like that. Um, unfortunately the, the, the literature is somewhat, um, um, scarce in that area in terms of having the normative data. Um, it's, it's a little bit better within soccer. I think soccer does a good job at quantifying, um, that, um, but other sports, um, it's been, it's been very limited. So I know like Jeff Taylor out of high point university put out, um, a systematic review. Um, I want to say a couple of years ago that started to kind of dive into some of that. Um, but unfortunately the data is just, just limited in terms of being able to plot any normative, normative, um, endpoints. So it kind of makes it a little challenging to, to say like, Oh, I'm going to take this you know, vast concept and try to apply it down to a, to a high school athlete or something like that. Yeah. I think that's the biggest thing because this is a pretty complex model with a lot of science behind it and a lot of technology behind it. So I think what we can try to do today is just try to figure out how we can apply this to that middle school, high school, sometimes even college athlete that's coming into our clinic and making sure that we're getting them properly to from surgery to performance. So for the listeners that might not be familiar with this concept, can you just break this control, the chaos model down a little bit, give everyone a sample size of what it's about? Yeah. So if, if I had to look at the control to chaos kind of continuum or even kind of Buckworth's model, I don't know if Buckworth has an actual name for his model, but both of them kind of follow a very similar, similar thought process, which is, you know, going from more of a very controlled linear environment to the opposite end of the spectrum and more of a highly chaotic and more of a reactive environment. Um, that's going to stimulate, um, very, you know, high speed, high D cell type progressions. Um, and, and they do this through what we call a constraint led approach. Um, so essentially trying to take a task, manipulate the task and kind of get what you want out of it by putting certain controls on it. Um, so within the, the initial kind of first stages, we're talking about more of a linear based progression. So keeping everything within the sagittal plane, um, you're keeping things very low key in terms of A cell, D cell. Um, within kind of that stage two, where we're progressing to some more multi-directional movement. Um, so I think this is where it can, it can get um, very complex very quickly um, because now you're talking about, okay, how do I manipulate speed? How do I manipulate angle? Um, if you guys are familiar with um, Tom DeSantos' work um, in, in that area um, with the whole um, was, was it, um, velocity, velocity angle trade-off, I think is what they call it. Um, you, can, you can realize it can get very complex very quickly. Um, so that kind of is what kind of sets the stage for the following phases, which is three, which is more of that kind of middle ground or reactivity phase, um, for what I would think is more of a perturbation based focus. Um, and then five is kind of this game simulation or trying to, um, kind of recreate the environment as best as possible. Um, so that's kind of like in a nutshell, I mean, if you look at kind of the overall goals, it's like, you know, let's look at how do we, how do we recreate this kind of reactive environment? Um, just kind of take a look at some of my notes real quick. Um, looking at this idea of, you know, tissue specific conditioning, I think is really important in terms of trying to get to those, uh, pre-injury chronic training loads. Um, you know, we can look at kind of along the same lines, but a little bit different in terms of, you know, metabolic conditioning or sports specific conditioning. I think that's a little bit different than kind of tissue conditioning. And then we can talk about this very, we can talk about this for a while, but it's this idea of ensuring optimal movement strategies within kind of ever changing sports specific environments. And so that could be another area where I think it's very subjective to the therapist in terms of what, what do they determine as an optimal movement strategy? Um, and then within what task. So for me, for example, and in, in a nutshell, um, 
I think the, the linear D cell is probably, or I should say linear D cell with a horizontal bias um, is probably the most important thing that we can try to get out of an athlete. Um, Cause that's where the highest demand on the knee joint is, is going to occur. And so for me, it's, it's taking that task and trying to figure out, okay, within a horizontally oriented deceleration task, how can I kind of pick and choose the, um, the strategies that I think are going to be, you know, most, most uh, rewarding or return on investment for me from a, from a, you know, mitigating uh, secondary injury risk. Um, so, I mean, we can talk about the idea of a dynamic systems theory and, and how complex that can kind of get. And, and basically how I was talking with some colleagues the other day and I was like, you know, at the end of the day, it, it kind of gets daunting. You know, you, you try to do these things within it, within a therapist perspective of um, retraining movement. And then at the end of the day, it's, it's almost like a self-select strategy in terms of all the tat or all the um, constraints that are going to be on a, on a movement. And it's like, well, you kind of just cross your fingers and you hope for the best thing, honestly, at the end of the day, right? Like you hope they select that movement strategy. Um, but I think it's one thing I've been kind of playing with is this idea of like, maybe regardless of the, of the task environmental constraints that, that they're, that they're placed in, um, can there be maybe a foundational strategy, say, say for like a lower, you know, center of mass or something that we can try to try to kind of recreate within these differing constraints, as opposed to trying to coach or cue like seven or eight different things. And you're like, I don't know if I'm going to get all those things. So it's like, as opposed to looking at a lower center of mass, controlling knee valgus, you know, looking at lateral trunk flexion, foot placement. It's like the reality situation is I don't think all those things are going to happen unless you have the perfect opportunistic opportunity. And um, I've been playing with this idea of if I just coach maybe one thing, maybe can that be a foundational thing that carries over regardless of those various constraints? Um, so, yeah. And let me, let me just orientate. So when we talk about the control to chaos um, continuum, that's starting according to the paper that we looked at, which let me go ahead and give a shout out to Matt Taberner because he has a lot of stuff um, regarding this topic. And the one that we kind of dove into that gives a really good uh, lay of the land for return to sport for a high level women's soccer player. Um, it's titled physical preparation and return to performance of an elite female football player following ACL reconstruction. Um, it came out in 20, 2020 and um, the British medicine journal. Is that right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, anyway, so it, the, the control to chaos continuum is, is starting ballpark. And this is all laid out very, uh, very well as far as timelines. But obviously, we know in the clinic is going to be blurry is around that six to nine month period. Um, but just knowing that obviously those first from zero, uh, from post op to six months, there's a a strong foundation and just strength training. Um, and then he called a gym-based physical preparation. And then they get into the, uh, the first phase of the control to chaos continuum. Um, just so people are aware that it's not something that's starting obviously from, you know, day one or first couple months out. Um, so Maddie, where do you feel like, because this is a long process and uh, it, it could go from the, the traditional would be zero to nine months, but we're learning now, obviously that the longer, the better, uh, particularly for the people returning to higher higher level athletics where do you find that pts fit into this model is there a point where you think the the pt start to fall out and you start to switch over to performance coaching and things like that or do you find pts to fit all the way through this rehab process yeah so first off i th i think even kind of taking a step back i think looking at that that timeline um you know when we're looking at, when we're saying traditionally nine months i think a lot of this is in regards to like just taking time off, right. In terms of mitigating secondary injury, but I even like the idea of extending it out even further, not so much of the, of the, from the notion of saying, Oh, Hey, we're going to maybe reduce the chance even more because I know, I think, you know, Grin, Grin, Grinham's paper doesn't really support that. And I think there was a, um, even a recent paper that, that was coming out of this, the, the Cincinnati children's group. I don't know if it got published yet or not. Um, I think it was at the prisms, um, uh, conference that it came out on Twitter or something like that. They were saying that I think they looked at like six months versus the nine months and didn't really find like a, a, a too much of a difference within, within their population. But I may be quoting that entirely wrong, but um, I'd have to look at it again. But essentially I, what, what I think happens is I, I think it, we have to take a little bit of a longer time, not so much from mitigating the risk of secondary injury, but this idea of like people, it takes, it takes a long time to develop some of these foundational qualities. You think of from a, from a healthy population about how long it takes to say develop, like horizontal deceleration, right? 
I mean, that's that you're, you're talking about potentially even years of a, a strength conditioning um, kind of program where we're trying to kind of nutshell it within nine months. Um, I think it just takes a little bit longer to develop some of those qualities. And we'll kind of, we'll, we'll look at that a little bit more, what I mean by that with, within the, the, the strengthening kind of base program. But you know, I just want to kind of take a minute and say, I think even the nine months needs to be extended out a little bit further, more so from the aspect of developing some of those very foundational properties that I think are going to be the, again, the most rewarding or the greatest uh, potential opportunity to, to mitigate secondary injury. But um, and to answer your question, Josh, um, I mean, I, I think it's, it's all dependent upon the, the, the background of the therapist. Um, you know, I think if there's any hesitancy regarding um, kind of these foundational strength and conditioning principles, you know, I, I think at that point, it's, it's best to say, hey, listen, um, I need to kind of, you know, I need, I need to kind of humble myself a little bit and kind of refer this person out to a strength and conditioning coach. And that's where obviously having your, your connections can really become important. Um, I think if, if the therapist feels comfortable and there is a, there is a, um, a, a strong foundation in these basic principles. And what I mean by basic principles are looking at things like, um, you know, for meals hierarchy, right. So kind of talking about this idea of having your foundational work capacity, strength, reactive strength, or power, and then reactive strength. Um, so understanding how to progress those things and understanding the various schemes in terms of, um, again, how do, how do we progress in terms of, sorry, maybe he's here some dogs in the background. Um, how do we progress this idea in terms of, you know, power strength in terms of, um, how do, how do we, um, yeah, how do we program accordingly? So one thing I've been thinking about in the clinic is from a frequency standpoint, from like a total volume duration, like, you know, it, it's not realistic within one session, obviously to, to get, you know, maybe eight sets of an exercise in or something like that. So, um, I think particularly if someone doesn't have access to the equipment they're looking for, I think it's trying to figure out how can we, like, is there a minimum effective dosage, um, that we can stimulate within the clinic? That's, that's kind of, kind of carry that out. Um, I know within the hypertrophy literature within a healthy population, I think there's, there's some data behind that. Um, but I don't know from a, from a strength perspective, if there's any, any data from a minimum effective dosage, but, um, that's just all to say, again, having that foundational understanding of like, how do we go from like foundational strength or like a tissue protection protocol, the foundational strength to, to getting into more of your power and more of your reactive strength work. And, um, you know, looking at these ideas of like, um, again, shout out to, uh, to Scott Morrison here. I took his class a couple of years ago. Um, uh, the slop and loading class, which was a great class. One of the best ones I've ever taken, but, um, looking at this idea of like, you know, proximity to failure in terms of intent and some of these, these foundational ideas of like, you know, how do you, how do you go about manipulating those, those variables in terms of getting what you want out of the, out of the person. So, um, I think having an understanding of like, again, Vermeil's hierarchy, understanding how to manipulate those three variables to get what you want. Um, and I think another very interesting thing is how do you manipulate the intensity within the context of pain, right? Because I think it's this idea of like, we talk about the state of um, strength and conditioning being the same within rehab. And that's true, albeit we are dealing with someone that is in pain or has an injury or something. So it's almost like pain becomes your, your, your number one factor, right? Um, in terms of how you determining intensity. And then if they're not really having too much pain, how to determine, okay, how can I use, go back to some of those basic principles and try to manipulate those things to get what I want. So um, I'd be curious to hear your guys' thought, but like, I guess within everything outside of tendinopathy, um, I'll usually use like a two to three out of 10 kind of pain threshold. Um, specifically, if we're talking with the context of like ACLR, it's like, well, I don't really want you to get like a two or above a, we'll say above a three within the, like the patellofemoral joint. Um, that just kind of tells me you're probably overload. It's, it's overloading too much. Um, but I'd be curious to hear your guys' thought in terms of how to use like a pain, pain threshold, um, obviously within the session, but also we want, you know, the 25 hour response later being there as well. Um, do you guys use anything particular, um, within the session to, to kind of moderate load or intensity? Yeah, I, uh, I kind of on the same deal with, um, sort of that zero to three range, you know, the, the little traffic light, green, yellow, red, zero to three rays, uh, zero to three versus four to five versus beyond. Um, it, with post-op it's, it's, it's a little bit different because we are obviously know, um, that pain is certainly individual and affected by a, a multitude of factors. Um, so loading being one of those. So I, I do sometimes tend, I, I, you have to keep the pain in mind because, um, when there's pain, you know, particularly in the knee, things are not going to go well as far as returning the quad and things like that. But I also have a pay a pay a lot of attention to swelling. Um, so if, uh, you know, if you're doing something and, and it's going to be probably more of a delayed reaction where their knee blows up, then you probably need to back off. Um, and then I guess the third thing I would say is for me, um, 
you know, if they're doing an exercise within session, it's highly painful. I'm not going to do that. And I'll try to, I'll try to find a way to modify it. And there's a ton of factors that you can change and still try to um, get the same adaptation you're going for. But I pay a lot of attention to, to that 24 hour post. Um, uh, so I tell p- patients, even 48, like, I'm going to ask you next time you come in, how did it feel, uh, yeah. you know, the next day. So read the write it down and remember. Um, so yeah, my main timeline is during post and then 24 hours post. Um, James, you got anything different? Yeah. I mean, I agree with that. And then also like what it actually feels like. So nothing sharp. You don't want to push right. anything sharp or pinchy. Yeah. If it's a little bit dull, two to three out of 10, that goes away right when you're done. I'm okay with that. And then just like Josh said, monitoring that 24, 48 hour pain response, making sure there's no increase in swelling. And then another thing that I do, especially early on is every time they come in measuring extension. So if that knee is getting a little bit irritated, they might start losing that terminal knee extension. So that's yeah. just another option to take yeah, those a look are, at. Those are all good points. I think one of the things that I, that, that we see within the rehab literature, just, just rehab in general, it's like, you know, we can't have any pain. Right. And it's like, well, the reality situation, I think we can have a little bit, right. As long as we kind of keep these vague uh, parameters in mind. Right. Um, I think we'll be in an okay place. And sometimes I know we even use it, Again, not to take tendinopathy and put it within this this um, this population, but sometimes that just kind of tells us we're getting the load that that we need, right? Um, to kind of get that adaptation, because it's like, well, yeah, I mean, if you if you don't stimulate enough load, then of course you're not going to have any pain, right? If you're if you're uh, if you're uh, two months out and you're still doing straight leg raises, you shouldn't be having pain, but again, it's because the, the load is not sufficient enough, right? So um, I was just curious, to kind of hear you guys thought, but that just kind of all goes back to say of like within the context of PT, you got to have to appreciate how do you manipulate those variables, but keep pain within the, 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 you know, backseat of in terms of how are you, how are you judging progression and so on and so forth. So um, I think those were the main things also just looking at, you know, periodization models, right. And in terms of the, the general, the general scheme of things, I don't think there's really one periodization model that kind of fits best. I think a lot of people probably follow a linear periodization model, but um, I kind of interested in this idea of almost like an undulating um, approach um, uh, more of like a, uh, I guess we, we call it like a daily undulating approach. Um, when we get to the different points, when we can kind of initiate power from the context of strength, I think it just, um, with, if anything, it just provides like a psychosocial enjoyment. Like, oh man, I'm not doing the same thing for a month. Like, oh, it's like every workout's maybe a little bit different, you know? So I think there's some enjoyment to that. Um, but do you guys have any ideas as well or preferences with, with periodization schemes that you guys have used? Well, before we get into that, let's go through your, your entire rehab model sure. just so we have enough time for all sure. that. Sure, yeah. sure, sure. Because um, <laughs> it looks pretty good. I mean, you, you sent us a pretty intense rehab model, and I'm always interested to see like how people go about planning. So yeah. let's get into that. Yeah, so this is going to get complex. So uh, strap your seatbelts on. Um, yeah. This might get a little a little interesting. I have some, some tangents here. But um, the first thing, so, so this has been – a thought process that has literally been something that has my, my entire clinical practice has shifted within the last, I'd say five or six weeks. So, um, recently, um, out of the Aspitar group, um, they, they came out with a study that looked at, um, vertical and horizontal jumps. Um, and they looked at the, uh, percent joint contribution from the hip, the knee and the ankle. Um, and, um, they quantified that with, with both propulsion and then landing. And so one idea that I've been kind of playing with is this idea of if we're talking ACL, if we're talking knees, um, someone has to show me that they can, they can do once it gets clinically appropriate to do a single leg knee extension or, um, like an isometric assessment, if you do an isometric exercise, you can still put a dynamometer on there and get a reading. Right. Um, so you can kind of get some biofeedback if you don't have a biodex. Um, but this idea of, you've got to show me that you can do this amount of weight and it's all relative to your body weight, which is the really cool part, right? We'll talk about, we'll talk about this later on as we progress in terms of the concept of LSI and why I think LSI is a good foundational piece, but I don't think LSI is where we need to go with things. Um, cause everything we do is relative to body weight, right? Um, whether it's an everyday task or a recreational task, like it's a squat very early on, or it's end stage rehab with the linear D cell. But it's this idea of you've got to show me, that you can do this percentage on a, on a single leg knee extension, right. And keeping those same parameters in mind that we talked about in terms of not experiencing the, um, the more than three out of 10 pain or the, uh, swelling, et cetera. Um, you got to show me, you can kind of do this before I progress your task. 
So I think what happens, I mean, I, I've seen, I see this on social media. It's like, and before I, I would have agreed with it, but now I'm starting to think like, as I'm getting more into the PTOA literature, um, and there's a really cool study that actually Susan Sigward's uh, group came, uh, came out with um, within the last month, they looked at just a squat task. And they put like insoles in somebody's shoes at like four months after ACL reconstruction. So that, um, you know, these people were significantly underloading their surgical side um, throughout just like two days of daily activity. And it goes back to some of their Susan Sigward's original work, which is this idea of learned non-use. And I think it's this idea that we're, we're throwing people tasks and they don't have the capacity to be able to perform the task. So my question, my challenge to physical therapists is, are you having someone perform the task or are you having someone perform the task with your intended goals in mind? Right. So, um, are, if you tell someone to do a squat and you're like three weeks out of an ACL, right. Are they going to do the task for you? Yeah. They're going to do the task, right. Are they going to do the task how you want them to do it with this, which is like to some degree symmetrical loading. They're using their quarter stuff like you hope them to. I would totally agree. Or I totally disagree with that, that notion that, um, if you're throwing these, these time points without having a relative norm to pull from, that they're just going to perform the task without, without really getting much out of it. Right. I mean, how many times have you seen someone do a step down, right. And they're getting just proximal deviations all over the place. And you're like, ah, well, it's coming from the hip. My argument would be like, nah, they're probably getting those proximal deviations because they're not bending their knee. Cause they don't want to, they don't want to go through an external knee flexion moment. Right. So it's this idea of how do you, how do you ensure that they have the capacity um, to be able to ensure that they can meet the task. Right. And so that's where this kind of two, um, this two month time starts with, which is really, I think is where we start kind of our bilateral stuff within the first month. Like you guys kind of talked about with, with my thought process, it's let's control pain, let's control swelling. If we can't control pain, then we're basically going to be shooting ourselves in the foot for the next nine months. Right. So let's get those things under control. Let's get your range of motion uh, in check. Um, and let's normalize gait mechanics, whatever that means. Right. Um, and, and this is kind of an interesting topic, um, that I've been kind of looking to recently. It's like, we don't really even have any good criteria to identify when, when someone is good to get off crutches, right? We just have our general time frames, which is, oh, you need to do, you know, 10 or 20 straight leg raises, you need full extension, you know, uh, you know, one, two plus in terms of your brush test. Um, but my thought process is like, why, why are we looking at some of these studies then? And people are one, two years out of an ACL reconstruction, their gait mechanics are still off. Right. And I think it may, it may go back to this idea of, um, we're, we're the, the, the capacity is not meeting the task, right? Someone's going to do the task for you, but again, it's, it's not going to look how you want. And I think, you know, obviously the, the challenge with that is, well, we're not within a lab, right? We don't have a 3d motion capture system or, or a, uh, a, a force plate system that spans the, the context of our ground. So how do we determine what that looks like? I think that's an area for research to hopefully explore to get a better idea. Um, one idea that I've been kind of playing with, um, within the early stages, looking at this idea of volitional quad control. Um, so Ryan Zarziki, um, I think I, I think I pronounced the name right, hopefully, um, came out with a study last year in JOSPT and they looked at this idea of, they measured, um, volitional quad control, um, or basically they looked at spinal reflexive excitability or sorry, that's corpospinal excitability. And then they looked at more peripherally in terms of, uh, ref spinal reflexive or reflexive spinal code, one, one of those. Um, and what they found was that corpospinal excitability had more of a correlation with overall isometric strength, right? So that goes back to some of your basic things in terms of like NEMS versus um, biofeedback, right? And I'm really interested in this idea of playing with, you know, can, I really want to get the, have you guys uh, had any experience with the M-Trigger um, biofeedback device at all? I've seen it on social not. media, but I haven't used it personally. Okay. Yeah, I'm really interested in this idea of almost like taking how Delaware has looked at their idea of utilizing neuromuscular e-stem until they get like 70 or 80% um, LSI, um, but reframing the switch and thinking, okay, utilize neuromuscular e-stem until they can get their quad and then just, just get after it with the biofeedback because I think we're, we're underlooking the importance of the volitional quad control um, in terms of getting that back. And so I'm playing with this idea of like, could you almost create a system where it's like relative to their contralateral side? Could that be maybe an indicator to say when, when someone may be appropriate to initiate gait, right? Um, so that's something that I just been kind of playing with. But that just all goes back to say at two months, we're looking at some bilateral stuff. So for me, um, let's say, uh, let, let's just do, it'll, it'll uh, make a little bit more uh, um, sense with putting a little bit of a case study. So James, what is your, what's your body weight? 
I'm about 215 right now, getting a little bit bigger. All right, about 215. <laughs> All right, so we'll, we'll say 215, right? And then we'll multiply that by 0.5 because we're saying that's about half your leg, right? Or half, half yep. your body. Yeah. If we take the Aspatar's, Aspatar's idea of a squat, which is a vertically oriented task, right? Um, within their models, about 34% was coming from the quadricep, right? So then we take half that body weight and we multiply that by, say, 0.34, right? So for you, for, for me to feel like confident in your ability, you roughly have to put out somewhere between 30 and 36 pounds on a single leg knee extension for me to feel comfortable with, with you doing a squat. Now, um, would I maybe regress that a little bit and say, again, because you have a good strength conditioning um, background, you know, being a college football player, you probably get there relatively quickly. Like, again, relative to a 15 year old, you know, female soccer player, right, who's starting off at maybe like five or 10 pounds doing a squat, you probably start off like 15, 20. So you're going to get there fairly quickly. But again, for me to ensure that, I'm feeling pretty comfortable with doing like a wall slide or something. You've got to show me some sort of capacity that's going to meet the task. Right. Um, and so that's been a model I've been kind of playing with and it's been kind of making a little bit since I've been doing it more so within, um, like non-operative cases. And, and it's pretty cool to see not only the, you'll see someone come in day one, you test them right. And be like, Oh my gosh, they're, they're just kind of everywhere. Right. And then you just do like, you just hound them with, if it's a, a new patient, for example, you just hound them with like the extensions. Right. And then lo and behold, you don't do any hip strengthening whatsoever, right? And they go back and all the proximal deviations kind of go away. So it's the idea of like going for your low hanging fruit and, and trying to see like what's going to give you the greatest return on your investment. Um, so that's been something I've been kind of playing with a little bit. Um, but it's like this idea of let's go for a bilateral strengthening, make sure the knee is just tolerating some of that stuff um, and you, use that as, as a general um, place to kind of start with, okay? With, with a focus on kind of tissue protection. What I mean by that is just kind of starting off on your higher rep range. So like a 10, 10 RM or something like that, right? Um, and then this gets to the idea of like um, proximity to failure, right? So early on, we're trying to stimulate hypertrophy. We're probably not going too much strength. So I'm, I'm probably getting on the higher end of that RM for someone. So whether it's manipulating um, tempo um, or if I'm just using maybe body weight and, and just kind of going to failure um, with really out any additional load, I think there's a variety of ways you can do it. Um, maybe I'm adding some, um, some stuff like you guys showed with, um, the BFR or something, right. Um, I think there's ways you can kind of get, get to failure, um, without putting too much stress and, and trying to mitigate some of those compensations. Um, but that's kind of the foundation for kind of for month two is more of our bilateral by the end of it. If they can show me that percent body weight to, um, to relative to, um, like a split squat norm. So this is something I've been trying to play with. Um, there's some cool research. Obviously, if you look at a single leg step down, that's 100%, right? 100% of your body weight. So that's pretty easy. And a bilateral squat's pretty easy, 50 and 100. So it's like, how do you use your progressions in the middle to figure out how do I take that, that capacity task kind of continuum? And um, so um, there's a cool study done by Chris Bishop um, out of the UK, uh, probably two or three years ago. And they looked at a rear foot elevated split squat um, and, and what was the, the percent contribution with the, the front leg versus the back leg. And they showed the front leg was about 80, 85% relative to the back leg. So I'll just take that same number, multiply that by 0.34. And that's how I'll kind of get an idea of like, okay, this is where we're going for when, when you're appropriate to do this task without me thinking you're, you're going to be compensating primarily through something that we can't see, right? Like your ankle complex or your hip complex. Because we know from Susan Sigworth's work, we can't see it, but they're going to do it. Right. So it's, how do we, how do we get some relative certainty to say, okay, you know, you might be mitigating this compensation a little bit. And then I'll kind of take a step back from that and look at a split squat. And I've been, a, I've been able to find any, um, any data on this research wise. It's just, it was a, um, uh, kind of more of a, a pilot study that was done. Um, and it was by, uh, what, what's the guy out of Georgia, Joel Friedman, Joel, Joel Seedman. Um, well, I pull something. Okay. No, I've, seen, I I've seen him. I've seen okay. Him. Okay. So I, I randomly found one of his, his things that he was talking about with a split squat and how it was saying that he had done some stuff on a fourth place system and how he found it was around 0.7 was the, was the front leg. So I'll take that same thing, 0.7, multiply that by 0.34. And that gives me an indication of when we may introduce split squats. So, okay. I mean, I just get this idea. Like I see stuff on social media, you know, someone's five weeks out and they're doing a rear foot elevated split squat out of an ACL reconstruction. I'm like, that's cool. You're doing the task, right? You're probably doing it, but are you getting, as a therapist, are you getting what you want out of the task, right? If you're trying to do that from, oh, I'm trying to build quad strength, which I, I, that's probably a secondary goal. For me, the functional stuff more or less gets to a coordination perspective, which will end later down the road, which we'll talk about within your D-cell. But if, you're, if your goal is to try to get quad strength, are you really getting quad strength? Because the quad is so damn weak at that point in time, right? 
Um, are you just getting compensations that use a therapist can't see through the hip and the ankle complex? I would, I would argue that you're probably getting more compensation for than anything. Again, are they doing the task? Sure. Are they doing the task like you want them to? I would, I would argue maybe, maybe not, you know, but can I, can I uh, ask here? And this is just because I really like that. I'm, I'm, I'm a big math fan. So I really like that percentages and, and taking their weight. And so if we take that to just a, uh, someone in the clinic, um, with basic technology or basic way to objectively measure that. Um, if we have the percentage and we have their weight and we're looking at a, and we're doing a bilateral, um, uh, movement. Yeah. I mean, is it as simple and you can tell me, you know, I might be wrong here. Is it as simple just putting a scale under them and ha- on, on, let's say we're doing a split squat or a, a rear elevated would be, would be good. Is it as simple as putting a scale under their back foot or maybe front foot and just seeing percentage wise, are they putting, you know, the 85% weight on their front leg. Um, yeah. I mean, is that I, a good way to do that? That's something I haven't played with uh, personally. Uh, I don't see why, why it couldn't be, um, especially if you're limited. I mean, I think everyone at this point in time should have a handheld dynamometer for goodness sakes or a, a crane scale or something, right. With, within their, mm-hmm. so, or if you got a knee extension machine, that's a great way to do it as well. Right. Just have them lift the load, stay within your, your protected range early on, right. You're going to be strong. It's at 60 degrees, 70 degrees. Um, of knee extension. So just have them kind of put out weight there and see what they can do. And that's going to be you know, obviously when it's appropriate graph wise, but um, do that there, see what they can do. And then kind of, kind of determine your, your, your functional progression, whatever you want to do. But um, I think, I think that the only challenge with that kind of goes back to this idea of like, if they put, say they put the 85% there, right. Are they putting the 85%? Are they, are they putting that 34% through their quad? Are they putting say 20% through their quad and the rest of it's going to the hip. And so even if they're doing the 80% or 85% on the front leg, what are we getting from the quad still? If that's our, like our overriding goal, if that makes sense, you know? So that's why I like the idea of like, just constrain the task to a single leg knee extension. The only way they can do that is through their quad. Um, and that, that can kind of give me an idea of like, all right, if this is what they can do. Well, this is what they can do. Um, and I'm sure. So you, so you would go, so sorry, you would, oh, you would, make sure that they can via a, a handheld dynamometer or, or knee extension machine, you're making sure that they have the capacity through their quad to do the task. Right. And then once that, cause, and then once they are doing whatever task you're asking them to do. Um, and I don't, is, is that the point where as long as they're, I guess, how do you quantify whether they're putting the right percentage of weight? And it's obviously super oh, yeah. gray, but between yeah, they, each leg if they have the capacity to do so yeah i think i think the only way that that happens from that standpoint is if you have a portable force plate system which i'd love mm-hmm. to have in my clinic i'd love to have a force dex or a, a hawkins dynamic system um i think that's a great thing so i've been playing with this idea of well like okay once because it's this idea of strategy and capacity right like there are two yeah. kind of things we'll talk about that at end stage testing as well um but it's just this idea of um you've got to have the, the capacity to be able to do it but mm-hmm. I think it's also important if you've never done the task, say you, you haven't done it for a month, right? Your motor learning is going to be like, what in the world am I doing? Like, I got to reteach a squat all over again. So I think that's where the biofeedback can be very helpful with the, with a force plate system. Teach them that, grade that task away. And hopefully the intention is they've learned it from you, right? In, in, a, in a graded, uh, graded um, or a faded approach, excuse me. Um, and then hopefully that carries over into like their everyday activities. They come back to see you then you just, you just keep hammering the quad until they've got the next percentage to do the next task. You do the task again, if, if you have that system and you just keep kind of teaching them, right? I think it's just that if you can teach them, um, I think the everyday activities can be very helpful for stimulating load through something. But the problem is someone learns a motor task because they don't have the capacity to do it, right? They're getting up and down a chair. They're going up and down stairs. They're doing it, right? They're telling you like, yeah, I'm like, I'm feeling good. But the problem is they're probably not loading their quad at all. They're probably not loading their knee whatsoever. Um, and then that motor pattern just gets learned. And I think we see that within Susan Sigward's work that they're just like significantly underloading it. And so we're basically like, we're teaching them something they, they don't have the capacity to do. And then we're like shooting ourselves in the foot because now they're doing the task repetitively and it's harder to get rid of something and reteach it as opposed to teaching it initially. I um, believe that that's kind of like my thought process behind the motor learning, um, stuff. So it's this idea of give them the capacity then teach them the task or practice the task. Um, and then just go back, go to your isolated capacity, um, until you have enough to be able to do the next progression within the squat, which for me, it goes bilateral split rear foot and then single. So I think it's one of those things when we look at that progression, like 
I think, you know, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but, um, you know, you'll, you'll have someone do a, a single like step down or a heel touch. Right. And if, if you do that, right. That is a very hard exercise to be able to do specifically for someone that's coming off an ACL reconstruction. So for me, like my, my anticipation is someone should, is probably not able to effectively do that. And effectively, I mean, by utilizing the quadricep, like I'm hoping them to honestly, until like three, three and a half to do that very, very effectively. Um, whereas you may see some stuff earlier, like, oh, you may, you may see people doing heel taps at like six weeks. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, like some, they're doing the task. Okay. Yes. Are, are they doing it? Like, like you're telling them to, yes. But are they doing it at all? Like you want them to, I would, again, I would just disagree that they're just, they're, they're shifting proximally, right. Their center of mass is going forward. So their moment arms decreasing, they're getting some proximal deviation, maybe a little bit of valgus. Maybe they're just, they're going contralateral pelvic drop to, to reduce knee flexion on that side. Right. So they're just shifting that leg down opposite leg. Um, again, I think a, a step down, a single leg step down, if it's done correctly, um, is actually a very, very hard task to be able to do. Um, if you're controlling that eccentric knee flexion or that, uh, external knee flexion moment, and then propelling yourself back up. Um, I think it's a very hard thing. And I think that kind of goes through our progressions as well. Like if you do them right, like we want them to, right. Um, they're, they're, they're much harder than I think what we anticipate they really are for someone coming off an ACL reconstruction. Yeah. I mean, I really like that progression. It's, it's awesome to think about making sure they have the parts to be able to complete the task. And you can always go through a, a block where you're, you're doing your bilateral squats, then you're progressing to split squats and then just keep on retesting. So what right. I'm thinking is using my little Tindec device, I can measure how many pounds they can produce. And that's a right. biofeedback device in itself. So they can actually see how many pounds they're producing pounds of right. force they're producing on my phone. So well, making sure, okay. Know. So I was going to say, we know like 60 to 90 degrees, the graph's going to not have any tension, right? Yeah. So, so it's isometric. That, that, that's one thing that I'm kind of playing with right now is like this idea of like trying to get people on board of loading a little bit earlier, right? So as mm -hmm. opposed to waiting like um, uh, the Fakuda study that looked at, you know, uh, four weeks introducing isometrics, like as long as we're not, as long as we're not placing a strain on the graph, right? Like we're, we're having people doing squatting and walking at like two, two weeks, right? After, after an ACL reconstruction. And that's, that's putting a positive strain on the graph. Like if we're keeping that 90 degrees, like it's a negative strain on the graph. So it's like, you know, should we be doing a little bit, should we be taking those isolated tasks, doing those a little bit earlier and then delaying some of the, some of the functional tasks um, so that they're, they're not basically compensating. And then this is just transitioning into a motor pattern that at two years later, we test them and they're doing the same thing. And we're like, well, we thought we corrected it at, at a month out of an ACL reconstruction, you know? So um, it, it's, it's orthopedic, but it's actually taking a very neuro approach to a lot of this stuff. Definitely. Definitely. So, so how do you progress into more of the jump training? Yeah. What are you looking for? Yeah. So, um, for me, um, this is an idea that I've kind of played with as well. I'm just kind of looking through my, my notes that I sent you guys. Um, you know, I think it's this idea of once they can do a bilateral task, right. From, from a strengthening progression, right. I think what happens is we think as therapists, we think in very linear approaches. We think, oh, you've got to, you've got to do this strengthening block before you hit this power block, right? And we don't think, oh, you could probably combine the two, right? So one thing that I've been kind of playing with recently is as I'm progressing to, to say more of a unilateral strengthening protocol, like a split squat or a rear foot, I should be able to do a bilateral drop squat, right? Like I should be able to kind of tolerate that in theory if I have the capacity to be able to do that. Now, speed's obviously a component that's a little bit different than, than what we're doing from the strengthening, strengthening aspect, but um, you know, I think it's, if you've got the capacity, let's at least try it and just go back to some of those basic parameters we talked about early on in terms of swelling, uh, range of motion, pain, like how are you feeling, right? Those are going to be our best things that we can utilize. So for me, it's looking at, um, you guys familiar with Lachlan Wilmot in, in mm -hmm. his kind of progression or kind of how he looks at plyometrics. So I really like this. I, I got introduced to this probably, this was which I think my daughter had her, had her ears or tubes in, uh, 2020. So this was like right before the pandemic. Um, I got introduced to, to his, to his theory and it's this idea of when we think of plyometrics, right. Um, we think plyometrics in its general sense of drop jumps and box jumps and all that. The reality of the situation is plyometrics can be started way earlier with foundational things, just looking at eccentric absorption stuff. Right. So, I mean, I'm even looking out from the context of um, month three, if, if month three, we're looking at some unilateral stuff from a strengthening standpoint, 
why not introduce some bilateral drop squats and start on Lachlan's theory of the eccentric absorption. Then, you know, the next month we're getting into eccentric absorption and concentric propulsion, all still within a vertical, vertical orientation. Cause again, we're thinking of running, right? Running's not very horizontal. Running's very vertically dominant, right? Um, based upon some, some literature um, that I found recently. So it's this idea of um, let's go through month three being our eccentric absorption with our vertical orientation. Four is vertical orientation with eccentric uh, absorption, concentric propulsion with maybe a little bit of some reactive strength work specifically from the ankle complex. So someone should be able to tolerate pogos at four months, something like that. Um, and then month five is where we're going through our return to run program. Um, again, people may be starting it earlier than me. People may be going three months, four months, but again, like I talked about earlier, I think a lot of these things are, they just need to be a little bit longer for people to develop those foundational capacities to be able to do those things. If we don't want them to maybe compensate years out. Um, but month five is where I'm probably doing my return to run program. If they've, if they've had those foundational, um, pieces, um, and then month five is where I'm probably getting into, I'm transitioning from a vertical orientation to my horizontal orientation with a specific focus on, uh, eccentric absorption. Cause again, at the end of the day, that's where your injuries are most likely going to happen, right. Um, is during that eccentric during basically it's, it's, um, stopping from a horizontal, you know, horizontal acceleration or max velocity movement. So if we can set a very good foundation at month five with very simple things from the eccentric absorption standpoint. So I'm looking at like um, like a four ball reach into a single leg lunge, right? Um, just very simple, simple tasks. And then progressing those things over time, like a one step stop or a one stop or something like that. Um, again, this all goes back as well to that capacity. So you've got to, you've got to know that, um, the vertical and, and, um, and horizontal kind of propulsions that we kind of talked about, um, and how that relates to the knee. So the reason that the knee, right, is going to be much more loaded during horizontal tasks it takes on 65% of your total load relative to 34% of your total load with a vertical versus the horizontal. So that's why for me, it's dude, like horizontal deceleration stuff prior to the on-field rehab stuff. It is very late because of the amount of load relative to uh, what you have to do. So James, we'll, we'll take your weight again. Um, so you said what, 215? 215. All right. So now we'll say, uh, we'll say a single leg task, right? So we'll, we'll take half that. So now you're doing basically 215 pounds, right? And we'll do 215 and we'll times that by 0.65. It's 140 pounds on a single leg knee extension that you need to be able to do. Now, not, not to say you have to be able to do that, but um, at least you're showing us maybe some relative numbers on an isometric assessment or something, right? To give me some relative confidence that again, when we get you ready for an on-field rehab component, you in particular, um, your knee is going to be able to hold up without you again, going through, if we, if we give you a horizontal detail task, well, are you going to, are you going to hinge strong at the, at the, at the hips, right? Are you going to go into a little bit of valgus? Like, are you going to relatively stay in a stiff knee? So again, everything for my continuum is based upon a, a certain percentage relative to your body weight. Again, symmetry is nice. And I'll use symmetry to say like, okay, foundationally, where are you at? But I've seen a lot of cases where symmetry wise, they're good, right? Like they're 80, 90%. But it's this, it's this idea of a of two flat tire analogy that, um, oh God, what's his name? Um, out, of, out of Creighton, Terry, Terry Grindstaff talks about, um, about this two flat tire analogy. It's like, cool, you've got an 85 or 90% LSI, but you're still weak, right? Relative to your body weight. So again, you'll do the task, right? But are you doing the task optimally? So at about five months is when I'll do my return, return to run something around there. And obviously there's probably going to be outliers in the case, right? Some people may come a little bit earlier. Some people may come a little bit later. Um, but I usually look, um, at about five months being my return to run, um, and doing that for a good four to six weeks. And the reason I do that for four to six weeks is because when I'm getting into my on-field rehab progression at about six or six and a half months, I base it into, I, I block it into two things. I have an intensive block and I have an extensive block. My extensive block is what's getting into not only my high speed running, my max sprinting, but also it's getting into my conditioning work. And just the way that I am, I base my conditioning work based off of um, mass testing. So maximal aerobic, um, aerobic testing. And in order to be able to do that test, you got to be able to run for about five minutes at, at the highest pace, at the highest pace possible. So for me, it's like four to six weeks give, gives me enough range, not only to get that five minutes under my belt, um, but also to, to feel pretty confident that we can do that test without the knee kind of, you know, blowing up on us and getting super irritated. Um, yeah. so that that's extensive and intensive. We'll talk about this in a sec, but that's where I get into more, um, specifically if, if we're limited in time and stuff, horizontal D cell, but also reactivity, 
um, that we can kind of talk about a little bit later. So let's take a quick step back. What do you look for in terms of beginning at that return to run progression? Yeah. Um, so obviously it's, you gotta be able to put out a certain percentage of your body weight mm-hmm. wise, right? Um, again, LSI, if we're measuring it through a handheld dynamometer, the literature would say based upon, um, Anthony Sinecor's work from, from university of Pittsburgh, um, 85%, I think is, is what the LSI metric was for, for return to run. So again, that's your foundational piece, right? Do you have that? Um, and then from there, we're looking at relative to your body weight. If we're looking at a run, right. Being very similar to a single leg step down. Well, you got to put out 34, 34% of your body weight, um, on a isometric test, or, I mean, I think with an isometric test, you have to look at it a little bit different because it's probably, you're able to produce a little bit more force than an isotonic. So you're probably able to put out what, like between 10 and 20% more on a, on an isometric test. If I had to put, put that somewhere. So again, you roughly got to be able to put out 34% of your body weight um, on, on specifically a quad test. I mean, I think from a hamstring test, you could probably look at more LSI because um, unfortunately, when we're looking at the, the data from the Aspitar group, when you think of hip extension, well, hip extension is coming through glute and hamstring. So there's not really, you can't really like judge that out per se. I think LSI is probably a good place to go there. If you wanted to look at some soleus stuff, maybe some soleus or hip abductor stuff, you could probably look there. But I think when you're looking at your, your low hanging fruit, um, you definitely got to make sure that it's the quad LSI, but more importantly, I think relative to your body weight, obviously you want your foundational pieces, right? Your quiet knee and all that stuff. Um, I don't really get too much in terms of the functional things, because unless you have a force plate system, doesn't tell me anything really. Um, if we, if we go back and look at a hop test, um, that Aspitar group, 12% uh, comes from the knee, um, on a horizontal hop. So that doesn't tell me anything, um, in terms of how far you're jumping. Right. Um, especially if I'm not video recording it. Um, I, I was, I was trying to reach out to, um, have you guys used the, my jump app? Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, so I, I was reaching out to, uh, to Carlos, um, I can't think of his last name. I reached out to him. On Twitter. With C. So, so yeah, something like that. And I reached yeah. out to him on Twitter and I was like, have you ever thought of the idea of like trying to quantify, like if you look at a hop test, right. You can do the hop test on that app, um, and get mm-hmm. kind of, I think you can get a symmetry from side to side, but also just looking yeah. at like from a landing aspect, you know, could you get some sort of symmetry on, on that test to get a better indicator from a functional performance test to be like, okay, I feel confident within here. Um, or even, I guess you, I don't know if you could look at it. Does, uh, do you, do you get a absorption, um, symmetry from, from like a, uh, like a, a counter movement jump or something on that? Can you get that? Or is it just propulsion from everything that I've seen? It's like jump height, power and force as well uh, as velocity. Okay, so they have more. that, they have the counter movement jump, single leg drop jump, Trap gotcha. jump, things like that. Gotcha. So it's probably, I mean, I guess potentially you could, you could look at ground contact time, but I think it's, it's, it's a little messy with a lot of stuff. So yeah. I think if, if you've got a force plate system, that's where I'm going with some of the functional performance testing, but you've at least got to have those isolated capacities for me in order to, to feel confident. Um, as well as just saying like, okay, you've gone through, you've gone through four months of rehab and your knee's been tolerating all these things. Well, that's just an overall kind of picture that I'm looking at to determine a return to run progression. Yeah. And I really like having, again, the parts versus the whole, making sure that you have the capacity to actually do it. Um, so some things that I've been doing, this is from Mick Hughes. So making sure that they can do, um, like a 30 second side plank, Mm -hmm. at least 20 single leg heel elevated bridges, 10 single leg squats to 90 degrees flexion, and then making sure they can do a heel tap off at eight inch box 10 times with good yeah, uh, lower the, extremity control, the 90 degree knee flexion. What are, what are your thoughts on that? Because running is going to be like what 60, 55 degrees in knee mm-hmm. flexion. Yeah. You're uh-huh. definitely not getting into that. And I, I would even argue like, again, going back to the heel tap, like mm-hmm. 90 degree single leg squat, right. Doing it, doing it well. That's a hard thing to be able to do. If, if you're asking the, to get the quad, I mean, you look at a healthy mm-hmm. population. I mean, I was, I was seeing something the other day of uh, um, a basketball player on social media doing a, a step down task. Right. And I mean, center of mass, I mean, the eyes were over the, the box. I was like, what are you trying to get out of this, this exercise? Like if you're trying to get the quad to be strong, well, your center of mass is so far forward that the moment arm is ridiculous. So mm-hmm. that just goes back to like understanding, um, your, some of your basic kind of biomechanical principles. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention this, this kind of come back into play. Um, and I was, I was getting, um, my mom would, would appreciate this cause she's a high school math teacher, but, um, basic trigonometry can be something that can be super helpful in the early stage. So like take, for example, um, we talked about that idea of maybe delaying the, the functional task, right. The, um, like the bilateral squat early on, 
Um, one thing I've been playing with is going back to some of your sign equations um, and doing that on a leg press, right? So if you think of a leg press is like 45 degrees, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think I calculated the other day, if we think of a, a regular leg press is about 75 pounds, just the, the plate by itself, um, a little simple sign math equation, that's about 53 pounds um, based upon some of those equations. So I've been playing with the, this idea of maybe we delay specific functional tasks like body weight stuff, but we still can introduce something like a leg press um, we're getting some patellofemoral conditioning earlier on. Cause I do agree with some of that stuff. Um, but maybe just trying to, um, figure out how do we do a better job at loading within a closed chain task if we want to call it that, but in a different way relative to body weight. So that was something I forgot earlier to mention. Yeah. And but for the, uh, put that 10 step progression, that was really well written in terms of the, the leg press, single leg, double leg, and then progressing to more of the, the standing stuff. Sure. Just to add to that return to running, um, it, obviously there's a, there's a ton of, a ton of information as far as benchmarks. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just going to throw in Chris Johnson stuff. Um, that's a lot of the stuff is the same from what you talked about. Um, Chris Johnson was there in PT. Uh, he looks at single leg balance, lateral step down, uh, calf raise, um, a lot of isometric stuff. So like a bridge of the straight leg raise hold, mm -hmm. um, side to side. But the other thing that we hadn't really mentioned or, you know, that, I don't know if he necessarily, he does this uniquely, but he does a lot, um, with a, uh, metronome. So making sure that you can keep like, for example, pogo jumps, making sure that you can keep a, um, uh, keep in sync with a metronome, for That's example, right. he says 150 beats per minute. Um, but just, just to throw it out, there's another way to measure that, to make sure that they have the motor control. Um, they'll do it, he'll do it with single leg hopping too. Um, uh, with some of his strengthening stuff, he'll just do it with heel taps to make sure that you can do it uh, along a metronome. Um, so just want to throw that out there as another thing to look at, particularly when um, a lot of the research in regards to where you want to distribute the load with runners um, is based off step rate, which you measure with a metronome um, or which you will alter with a metronome. Sure. I know, I know Tom Goon has Tom Goon Goon. Um, Goon, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I was like, I'm going to butcher that name again. Um, I, I know he's got some work in there as well. Like he'll have people just do like in place stationary hops or something. You just kind of see mm -hmm. how something you respond. So it's almost like taking this idea of looking at various people um, that are like experts in various, various realms and saying like, okay, if you're a return to run expert. Like I know I've, I've done a lot of, I've looked into Rich Willie's work as well um, and taking like, okay, you're an expert in this area. Well, I'm going to try to take your knowledge and, and try to apply it within you know this context. So like taking Rich, Rich or Tom or Chris, um, and do the return to run Matt Tabiner with the on-field rehab, you know, just taking just, just different progressions. And as a, as opposed to looking at like, I don't know, um, how it's done in, in the past where it's like, you know, people may not have as good of an understanding of like that specific point in the rehab process. Um, I try to look at some, some other experts and see what they're saying as well. Yeah. So can you talk about your energy system training and your testing there? So again, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, mass testing is the, is the foundation for, for everything that I do. Um, and so a mass test is, it's a five minute. Have you, have you ever done a mass test before? I personally have not, but I've read and, about uh, it. So again, this was, this was something that I picked up from, uh, Scott Morrison's, uh, course. Um, I wasn't really familiar with, with the idea of mass or maximum aerobic testing. Um, but I like that because it can set a foundation for us kind of moving forward. Um, there's a guy and I have no idea what his name is off the top of my head that I saved this post on Twitter a while back. Um, but he looked at this idea of repeated sprint ability and what are the foundational principles that you need for repeated sprint ability. So if you just take the word down, it pretty much explains itself, right? You need to be able to repeat sprinting. I mean, that's, that's what you have to do, right? So there's these foundational pieces that I like to kind of get at, um, in terms of my, my base. So um, there's been some further mathematical equations that I've done um, looking at max testing and how that relates to maximal sprint speed. Um, so the good part, um, and, and Damian Harper, um, if you guys don't follow him on Twitter, he's a great guy for, for a lot of deceleration stuff. Damian Harper made this graph a while back where he looked at what was the ground reaction force um, during max velocity. I'm not gonna pull this up real quick. Uh, max velocity. Uh, max A cell and uh, max D cell. And there was a cool little graph. I'm gonna see if I, I have it up here still. Um, what is this? Um, there it is, okay. Um, 
So if we look at, at those factors, right? Um, so based upon this graph that he was able to put together, um, max D cell was approximately 5.9 uh, times body weight. Max velocity was about 4.4 and max A cell was about 2.2. Um, so between max D cell, and max A cell, about a 25 or max velocity, excuse me, about a 25% difference. And then between max D cell, and max A cell, there's about 63% difference. So for me, that just kind of tells me that I feel pretty comfortable because of the, the degree that ground reaction force is going to be very low. And again, it goes back to the Aspatars group, which tells us that, um, when we look at a horizontal jump, right. It's going to be very or acceleration, right. They're, they're, they very kind of correlate to each other. It's going to be very hip extensor dominant, right. Um, so I don't really have a problem as I'm doing my, um, as I'm doing my energy systems work, adding in some A cell work as well, right. Relative to my D cell work in terms of intensity of effort, because I know it's probably not going to be huge demanding on the knee. Um, but when I'm looking at, um, D cell work, um, again, um, Scott has done some, some good stuff. I'm pretty sure he's talked about this within his energy systems development work. Um, but we'll start with what he calls, uh, kind of peripheral capacity training, um, and then we'll go into um, kind of maximal aerobic power training. Um, and those are the main things that I kind of look at. I'm not a big fan of doing um, what we call like central central capacity training. So that's where you think of like your traditional ele um, like long, slow distance training, things like that. Mm -hmm. Because we know within the um, within some of the interval based work, um, and this gets into the, the, the high intensity group, um, that you can actually get better aerobic gains by doing say up to a hundred percent of, um, mass, or even when the knee can tolerate like 20%, um, those are going to get better gains than just throwing somebody on a bike or having them run for 30 or 40 minutes. Right. And you could even argue if you're having someone run for 20, 30, whatever, they're probably getting a lot more on their knee, um, that may not feel too good relative to doing six sets of a two minute interval or something like that. Um, so that, that's kind of the approach that I take for all my kind of conditioning is more of this, um, this interval based work, depending upon what I'm trying to get at someone. Um, and that'll be more of the, the extensive side of things in terms of the overall planning process. Yeah. I think that's an often forgotten part of rehab and even early on before they can start tolerating more loading, you can get them on like a concept two rower and assault bike, a Versa climber. You can start building some of that capacity early on. Mm -hmm. without even thinking about running. So they're just able yeah. to recover more and then keep up their capacity before they even start running. Yeah. I mean, heck you could throw, you throw, you got some, um, got some ropes in the gym, right. <clears throat> just, just throw some of that stuff on there. Oh. Um, in terms of just upper body stuff, if you have, I don't know what is, is what, I don't know the exact name of the thing where you kind of pull it down that thing. What is, what's that called? Yep. The skier concept yep. to yeah. skier. Sorry, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I just know. I just know what it is. Um, My ball work, a whole <laughs> so, bunch of that. Uh, yeah. So, so just, again, a lot of upper body stuff. Right. Um, and cool stuff about that is like, again, you got a heart rate monitor, throw that on someone, right. Just take your RPE do just take your heart rate like that. I and mean, that's what I do when I work out. I mean, I just, just do this and that's how I base my own kind of, um, interval based work off that. So, I mean, it's simple stuff. I just think we, we overlook it because we're trying to do like a million other things. Again, are they going to have the grace return investment? Like, I, I, I don't know if they're, they're going to you know, be well for us. Right. It's like, I don't think rehab has to be complicated. I think we make it complicated, unfortunately. Yeah. All right. So moving forward, how do you get on to more of the, the on-field rehab? So we've gone through the strength work. We've gone through the, the straight line running. Mm -hmm. What do you look for in terms of getting on the field? So are we talking about from a testing standpoint? Are we talking about from like just exercise progressions? Both. So what, what makes you confident in terms of getting the athlete back on the field? Um, so first off, going back to what we talked about, 65% of body weight on a single leg knee extension. If you've got roughly around there, um, probably 55% or something, right? I'm starting to kind of feel com confident with our foundational stuff that we're working on. Um, so one of the foundational pieces, and I guess I'll even take a step back. When I go through my on-field rehab progressions, again, as I mentioned earlier, it's broken up into two phases. It's intensive and it's extensive. So um, I think that comes from Matt Tabin or, or Matt Tabin or Mac Buthorp. One of them kind of dove into that concept. I was introduced to it on Instagram from uh, Nicole Sertica. Um, she kind of broke that down a little bit more, um, which kind of helped me kind of conceptualize what that was really looking like. Um, but when we kind of talk with the, about this idea of kind of intensive and extensive, um, extensive is referring to having like larger areas to perform our exercises, whereas intensive is more, more condensed. 
um, and very high metabolically demanding, not to say that X sensitive isn't because it is, but it's just larger areas to perform some of that stuff. So from a programming standpoint, it's extensive is going to be our conditioning. It's going to be our, um, our high speed running once we get there, right. Percentage wise. And then our max speed sprinting as we're progressing towards like stage, you know, stage three, four, et cetera. Um, our insights of work is purely focusing Well, not purely, but it has a heavy emphasis on, I should even say a cell work to some degree may fit within that, depending upon, um, clinical time that you have available to you. But, um, our, uh, our intensive stuff is going to be our A cell, our D cell, but a lot of our D cell, it's primarily where our focus is going. And then once we get to the phase within stage three, it's going to be some of our react, uh, reactivity work. Um, so that's where you can start throwing in some of the neurocognitive or kind of, uh, spatial temporal awareness stuff. Um, I think from an overall perspective and, and part of this bias has been, um, been driven through Eric Myra. Um, one, one of the, one of the biases that I have is that I think we overlook heavily, um, the, the importance of having the, the ability to perform a linear deceleration task. I think we're seeing a lot of stuff in research now, which is, which is important about the whole idea of like um, the neurocognitive awareness and spatial temporal capacity and some of those things, um, which I agree. But you'll even hear Dustin Grooms, who is like the lead author and all the stuff, he'll say the meat and potatoes of what we do is strength and conditioning, having, having those foundational things. And then this is kind of extra, right? And so, um, I think we, we overlook the linear D cell task, right? And we also think that vertically oriented tasks are gonna carry over to linear deceleration tasks, which they're not. Vertical, vertical tasks are going to train you for a vertical task, right? They're, they're, not gonna carry, they're not gonna carry over, they may to some degree, but they're not gonna carry over like you're intending them to, to a linear deceleration task. And I think we can break that down to the 34% versus the 65%. They're a total load, they're complete different capacities that the knee's gonna have to require. So for me, like within an in-clinic session, I'm trying to kind of figure out this idea of, again, what's the lowest hanging fruit for me and what's going to give me the greatest return on investment. So for me, it's the intensive focus within clinic. Extensive will be, hey, I'm communicating to the coach if I have a relationship with them or I'm communicating to the parent and the kid. This is what I want you to be working on, right? From an exit. So it's like getting them back on the field a little bit, right? Getting them back on the court. So they kind of feel like they're still kind of being involved with, with the team. But it's like, hey, these are our parameters. These are what we're going to follow from an extensive standpoint. Intensive, this is what I really want to try to focus on. Because again, if I'm trying to focus on these optimal movement strategies, um, I've got to have my eyes on the person, right? Because um, if we just let them and go out, they're just going to do whatever they want based on a dynamic systems approach, um, most likely. Um, and so- from a clinical perspective, it's very horizontal deceleration task. Um, and it's starting very, very light. Like we're talking 40, 40 or 50%, right. In terms of effort. Now, how I judge that in terms of how am I judging effort wise, um, is based off of a model, um, by Philip Graham Smith. Um, Philip Graham Smith is a researcher out of Askatar. Um, he's part of the force Dex group. Um, he came out with his really cool study, um, I think two or three years ago and looked at, um, the percentage of like, say you took a 20 meter sprint. Um, he looked at what percentage of that time was spent accelerating versus what time was spent decelerating. Um, and all that's how I'll kind of judge my progressions within the on-field kind of rehab component from a linear horizontal deceleration task. Um, so I'll use kind of that model. Um, and, and the idea behind that is um, trying to, again, you're trying to kind of meet the person where they're at and you're trying to ensure those optimal movement strategies, whatever that, whatever that is for you. I think it's also trying to give the athlete an understanding of what they're able to do. So I've heard this within the, the context of Rich Clark, who is a, um, a strength and conditioning coach in the UK. And he's talked about this idea of, um, I think oftentimes what happens are our, our athletes, when they go back to return to sport, they put themselves in situations that they don't understand what they're actually able to do. Right. So they don't know, they're not able to judge it. If I'm going like, let's say 80%, right. What does that mean? Like in terms of when do I have to slow down my task relative to the capacity that I have available to me? And I think we overjudge that. And then we throw that, we throw that very foundational piece with the linear D cell on top of the neurocognitive principles where they're having to attend to all the different stimuli within their environment. That's where we kind of run into our problem. So my bias is we don't do a good enough job on the linear D cell stuff. We don't really train someone to appreciate what am I able to do at this point in time, right? Or heck, we don't even train it at all. Um, and then we ask them to go back. We just, we just say like, Oh, we're just going to do some, some drop jump stuff. Or we're going to, we're going to have them kind of do some, some linear D cell stuff and not really be very objective in terms of how, we're, 
how we're, um, how we're judging that, because I think we've got to do a better job at judging that very similar to how we judge our exercise early on. If you're going to be very strict in terms of your sets, reps, your range of motion, everything, you got to do the same thing within your linear D cell. If you want to get the progressive overload you're looking for, you can't just like throw someone out there and tell them to go hundred percent and they're going to be able to handle it. They don't even know what that looks like. Like I've seen a lot of stuff early on when I was practicing, it was like, Oh, I'm just going to do like five yards or 10 yards and have them do like a one or two step or three step stop. Um, but I think we, we can do a better job based upon the Philip Graham Smith model. Um, and so that's what I'll do uh, from an intensive standpoint. And then also when the time allows for, um, even when we start, to, I, I take a step back, when we start to do the, the multi-directional work, um, again, for me, it's, it's still important to work some of those angles, but the reality of the situation is, I've even looked at this from, from a performance standpoint, your ability to change direction is all based on your ability to stop. If you can't stop, then you're, you're putting yourself in a horrible position to be able to get back into the sagittal plane to, to be very hip extensor dominant, right? So I would even argue that deceleration can have, can have a performance aspect in terms of change of direction. So as opposed to like, again, getting caught so much on like, oh, I've got to work this angle velocity trade-off. It's like, just get them really, really good at the linear decel stuff and then gradually expose them to some of the change of direction stuff. And so that's why for me, the change of direction is like, it's, Intensity wise, it's behind where the linear D cell stuff is because I'm introducing it a little bit earlier. Um, but I don't get so caught up. It's like if within a session, if I don't have time to get a change of direction, I'm like, okay, well, I'm at least getting your linear D cell stuff. And because that's that's gonna have the greatest, at least in my opinion, my bias, that's gonna have the greatest return on investment for not only maybe mitigating secondary injury, but also performance enhancement. So um, I'll progress those things. Um, again, through a constraint led approach, Matt Tabner had a great paper that came out a couple months ago where they kind of looked at that within more of a, um, more of a actual, um, uh, uh, clinical applicability setting. Like how does that look in terms of a constraint led approach? And so I'll kind of use that same system in terms of how I progress, um, more of the reactivity, um, kind of component to it. Um, that's kind of like how I set myself up with a clinic, but also out of clinic. I think the challenge becomes if you run into a situation where you're limited in your number of visits, um, like if you only got 30 visits in a year or something like that, well, now you're having to plan a 12, 14 month rehab process in like the first month or two. And it gets like a little overwhelming at times. Um, but I think we've got to maybe do a better job in those situations of not, you know, blowing through all the visits early on and doing a better job at like, let's get them. If, if you're, if you have that foundational knowledge, like we talked about at the beginning, if you have that comfortability with coaching those things, um, we've got to ensure that the visit, they have those visits at the, you know, the six to the 12 month time frame because, um, a lot of stuff early on, as long as you just kind of tell them what to do and give them a progression, they have access to a gym, like they're going to be fine. Um, they'll, they'll know what to do. So, um, I think we've got to like do a better job at, um, you know, kind of taking the reins off a little bit early on if, if we're limited in the visit count. Yeah. And, and how do you manage allowing the athletes to get back with their team? Yeah. So that kind of goes back to understanding the, the on-field rehab model, right? Yeah. So like within stage one, when it, where it's linear, it's like, all right, from a, from a ball standpoint, it's just stationary back and forth, dribbling, nothing crazy. So um, two is multi-directional, multi-directional without really a, a ball kind of coming into the equation, maybe a little bit, but not, not too much. Three, um, I'm trying to think from, from my progressive model, kind of how I kind of go about some of this stuff. I'm um, just kind of taking a look at my, my own model. Um, so three is, is we're all kind of allow some of, some of that work, um, in terms of getting into, to some of the ball work. Um, I mean, I think it's just, it's just kind of understanding kind of general parameters of like, Hey, a lot of our on-field stuff is going to be more extensive driven, um, in, in really trying to say like, Oh, like you can work on, like, as, as you're getting more advanced in the program, giving them more, um, flexibility with the conditioning protocol, um, maybe working on some warm up based stuff and saying like, Hey, we're just going to focus pure linear. And I want you working at a certain percentage. And I would even say, if you're going to do a subjective percentage, bring it back. So scale back. If you're, if you think they should be at 80, tell them 60, because the reality of the situation, if you tell them 60, they're probably going to be on 80 or something. Right. Um, and that came out actually within the strength and conditioning journal where they looked at that, they gave them subjective numbers and they said like, Hey, work at this percentage. And the person was working much higher than what the coach was telling them to do. So maybe give them maybe like, and Nicole says it, she'll say, don't give them something unless you've seen them do it in clinic. And I kind of agree with that. It's like, if I haven't seen you kind of do it, um, or I don't really have comfortability, like obviously running or conditioning is going to be very controlled. It's very linear. So if I haven't seen you really done a lot of that, I'm okay with that. But as we're progressing to more of the intensive stuff, 
Um, if you haven't done it in clinic, then I'm not really going to allow you to do it uh, in the context of the field. And then just kind of communicate with the coach, hey, these are the parameters that we can follow. This is what we've done within the clinic. This is what I'll kind of allow you to do. Um, and then what I would say is for me, and I think this goes to the whole model as a whole, like on-field rehab is just the starting point, right? On-field rehab is a starting point to return to practice. I think once people think we go through on-field rehab, then they're just like good to go and play again. But the reality of the situation is like, no, you're going through practice integration. So you have non-contact, contact, full integration, and then you're going into actual gameplay, which would be more of that return to um, return to um, competition, I think, as, as Clara Dern kind of says it. Yep, return to competition and then ultimately return to performance. Yeah, those are almost yeah. synonymous with each other. Mm-hmm. Baseball and Tavern and Ardern's models. Yeah. Uh, on-field rehab is, I'm trying to think of, what, is, what does Claire say for the, for the first? It's return to... Return to training. Return, return to, is that what it is? Yeah. Oh, return so, to training, competition, oh, return, practice. Participation, that's what she says. So yeah. she says that, whereas that's kind of interchangeable, at least in my mind, with the on-field or on-court rehab. Return mm-hmm. to sport um, within that model is synonymous with return to practice. And then return to performance is synonymous with return to competition. So um, Tabner, I think, talks about that within his case case study where he talked about this idea of um, when you kind of throw someone out there, there's almost like a neuro, there's a, a neuro kind of heaviness that um, because they're having to attain to all the stimuli, like they put them on heart rate monitors or something like that. And they see that the heart rate just goes up significantly because they haven't been able to adjust to that. So I've almost had this idea hearing it from Eric as well of like when you get them to go back and you have them kind of training practice wise like take them a step below. So if you're working with um, an 18 U or something soccer player, put them down at 16 or 17, where they don't, again, they're, they're much better than those athletes, but they're the, the neurocognitive um, perceptual stimuli isn't maybe as high as they would have to um, compete against like their same age or something like that. So um, that's kind of the progression in terms of going from a highly controlled linear to a highly chaotic. And we can talk about that a little bit more if you want to, but um, I think it's important to appreciate uh, we don't we don't throw someone right back into um, to, to game. It's you've got to go through you know one to two maybe three weeks of the, of the individual stages within practice, and then you're you're slowly integrating back into competition. So again, that's why I think nine months. It's it's not so much that I'm that I'm progressing it way beyond that to like fourteen months or something because I'm trying to say oh you're spending more time to reduce the risk of injury, but it's just it's a gradual integration. It's uh, something that takes a lot longer than I think we give it credit for. Yeah. And what, at what point do you do your formal testing? If you do any formal testing? Yeah. So I'll go, I'll go four, right? So four months is probably the first place that I'll start. I'll maybe even progress it out to that first point of return to run to maybe even five. Um, I don't, I mean, I don't really see, I think there's the principal research to show that you at least need a month of a month off to get some differences in your testing results. So probably four or five is where I'm doing my first one. Then six as we're so like basically before return to run somewhere around there then uh, prior to implementation of on-field rehab or on-court rehab. And then I'll probably do the end stage whenever we're looking at um, going through those various progressions, probably at the nine to 12 month mark is where I'm doing my, my last kind of testing time frame. Um, in terms of what I'm looking at, uh, as we mentioned earlier, capacity versus strategy. Um, so obviously get your, get your foundational things, um, get your quad LSI and get your quad um, relative to body weight and see where that's at. Um, that's kind of where I, where I go with the isolated stuff. You can test all the other stuff, you know, hamstring, particularly if it's a hamstring graft, um, or they have a, have a history of hamstring strains. I think that's important to look at as well. Um, but look at some of your other metrics if you want to. Um, but I think hopefully a, a shift moving forward will be more of accessibility within the portable force plate system. So, um, the, the metrics that I would, what I would want to look at if I had a system, um, that I was kind of just putting together would be, um, Let's see. So I, I look at the context of both a single, I would look at a single and a double leg. So this comes back to some of Daniel Cohen's work um, out of, uh, I think he had wrote something in Mass Guitar Journal as well, but they looked at this idea of, you know, oftentimes we think of a single as the best metric, but double can be beneficial as well because now you're getting the optimal braking velocity um, because someone feels comfortable with going on two legs. And you may get more of an expression of asymmetry at that point in time. Um, so I'll look at it. I, if I had access to this, might do a double and a single. Um, look at both, um, both the eccentric, um, also concentric, but also peak landing. Um, so I'd look at, um, trying to have my metric that I had here earlier. Um, I don't have them off the top of my head, but I basically look at eccentric RFD. Um, I'd look at eccentric impulse. Um, I look at concentric impulse and like, I'd look at peak landing. If I had access to a Hawkins dynamics or a four stack system, um, that's probably what I would look at within that. So I think it's important to not only test capacity, 
but also see strategy wise, what are they doing for you? Um, if we're talking about the motor learning movement perspective as well. Um, I think, you, I mean, I know they've done a lot within the vertical. That's more of like a counter movement jump. They've done it within the context, but I think it can be beneficial as well. I know Matt Jordan started to kind of look at this out of the university of Calgary, but doing jump, just doing like that horizontal detail jump onto, or jumping basically onto a, um, onto a force plate system. Yeah. What about any change of direction testing, like a T test or a five ten five agility testing? Do you take a look at any of that? Uh, I do a five Oh five. Um, I think if anything, the five Oh five is going to be more of, I think it's very similar to a lot of our functional testing. It's probably more of a sensitive mm -hmm. metric more than anything. So if there's a large deviation in their time from side to side, then it probably just tells you there's, again, a difference there, right? If there's not really a difference from side to side, but I don't know if it's really going to tell you much in terms of differences really being there. Sorry, my dog's going in. Um, but really a difference being there. Um, and I think Enda King's work has looked at this out of, um, uh, the, out of Ireland where they've looked at the 505 and how the time isn't really maybe a factor relative to um, their very complex system in terms of uh, the mechanics and how they perform the task. So if I were to look at that, uh, if there was a, if there was a, a difference, okay, but well, there's probably something going on that we need to address, right? If there is, if there's not a difference, it's not that I'm saying, oh, I'm not going to continue to work on this. I'm probably going to work on this. It just uh, tells me that there's not maybe a large asymmetry that may be different from side to side. Um, so I think if you don't have access to something, it's, it's a good place to start. Um, and, and I mean, you can film it too and see if there is that difference as well. Not to say that your, your coach's eye is everything, but at least it gives you something to work with. Um, but I think it's more of a sensitive metric more than anything. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. And, and what are your thoughts on returning athletes to their previous norms or even better than their previous norms? So I know like a lot of high school football players, they know what their previous deadlift or back squat or vertical jump mm -hmm. was prior to their injury. What do you think about that? Yeah. So that stuff. This is where I think um, PT needs to go in general. I think oftentimes we have this notion of return to prior level of activity. And I don't think that's good enough. I think we've got to, ret we got to return them better than when they were before. Um, and that's just, uh, if you kind of look at like, you know, visits prior to discharge and stuff like that, I know we have a, a lot of our research is kind of put on this idea of like, oh, we want to get people out as fast as possible, um, which is a good thing for sure. I agree with that. At the same time, though, I think we're trying to weigh of how are we putting this person in the best position possible to ultimately have long-term success. So I think as opposed to just getting back to their prior level of activity, I think we've got to get them a little bit better if, if we have the time and you know, ability to do that uh, from a visit count standpoint. I think that's ultimately where we've got to be able to go um, if we're trying to, again, from our standpoint, reduce the risk of you know secondary injury or something like that. So I'm, I'm in full agreement of that. I've had conversations with people about it as well. I know there's... The, probably 10 people in a room would have 10 different kind of you know, opinions on it, but that's just kind of my bias. Yeah, definitely. I know that's something that I'm looking at a lot is making sure that they are better than their previous norms because their previous norms is what got them hurt as well as matching their peer standards. So if we know a D one running back should have a 400 pound squat and your athlete only has a 315 squat, they're not good enough to be matched with right. their peers. So they need to be able to match their peer standards or better. Right. I mean, it all goes back to that whole notion of like being able to generate three newton meters per kilogram. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, I think, I think, you know, my personal bias, and this has shifted over the last few months is like, again, LSI is cool and you got to have that, but you got to have your ability to do self body weight. Cause that's how we're doing everything. Um, and so making, making it more relative to the person, I think is where you've got to, where you've got to be at. And then if you have baseline norms or baseline data, that's awesome to try to shoot that off times within you know, clinical settings, we don't have those baseline norms. So it's like, let's just get you to at least the body weight perspective and, and, and kind of hope for the best at that point in time. Again, have a good strategy perspective um, if you have availability to that testing, but at least get the isolated stuff down, at least get the, the capacity down. Um, and we, we know we can do that in a very simplistic fashion. Anyone can do that. So yeah, um, that's, why, that's, my, that's my bias with some of that stuff. Awesome. No, I, I definitely agree with that. And so we're going to start wrapping up here. Do you have any more thoughts or any other things that you think are important for our listeners to know? Um, I think what's, I think what's, what's important with, with this, but really all rehab in general is that go for your low hanging fruits, understand, you know, mechanisms of injury, where things are likely to happen. So within the context of ACL reconstruction, um, uh, Frances Francesco de, de la Villa, um, mm -hmm. in the isokinetic group just put out a good, um, like a video analysis review or something where they looked at a bunch of ACL um, injuries and where they were likely to happen. And 
And what they found were that circumstances in which the individual had to pertain to a lot of stimuli or attend to multiple stimuli, um, as well as activities that had a high horizontal velocity associated with them um, were situations that were inciting events potentially for ACL injury. So I think it's understanding what are going to be the lowest hanging fruits that I can get out of this person um, that I can give this person. So I think if time is limited, you've got to go to some of those things um, and really address those things. If you want to feel confident, don't get, don't get caught up in how does everything else look right? Like, yeah, like Eric, Eric Meyer talks about this idea in terms of, again, would it be great to have more hip abduction or trunk flexion and, or trunk stability and all those things? Yeah, it's great. But if they can't go through, if they can't control an external knee flexion moment through their quadricep, well, then everything else is just, it is what it is, right? I think you've got to do the, the, the little things right. And it all starts down from day one, um, volitional quad control and just progressively ensuring, at least in my opinion, progressively ensuring that the task meets the capacity. Cause I think there probably is some validity. Um, I I'd have to test it out. It'd be interesting to look at, but I think if we're looking at what are our goals in terms of our exercises, again, functionally or a functional task, uh, if you want to call it that, um, I think is not so much of getting strength back, but I think it's more or less building um, coordinative strategies. Um, and so for me, if I'm looking at something like a linear D cell task, which is where these injuries are likely to happen, well, what do I want to try to ensure? Well, I want to try to ensure that someone is maybe maintaining a lower center of mass and having a relatively posterior weight shift. Not to say that a squat is going to carry to a split squat, which will carry to a rear foot, which will carry to, um, to, a, to a linear D cell, more biased task. But I think it, you, you kind of build foundations for things to kind of build off of. Not to say that things transfer or carry over from task to task, because I think motor programs are entirely different from task to task. Um, but I think that you're, you're building a foundation. If you can do those foundations early on very well by, again, ensuring that task meets capacity, then hopefully we can put these people in good situations, not only within their activities of daily living, but also as we're getting back to that return to sport performance, hopefully, hopefully developing those coordinated strategies over time um, where those motor tasks have kind of carried over. And again, at the end of the day, if, through that dynamic systems approach, I mean, you're just hoping that things kind of work, right? That all those constraints kind of um, work together and, and the person can kind of pull from the task that you've been practicing on. But my, my thought is at least if we can maybe practice one of those strategies, like a posterior weight shift with, with our task, hopefully regardless of maybe what position they find themselves in, they can kind of recollect that. They can remember that within whatever speed or um, semi they're kind of faced with um, and they can kind of put themselves in a good position if, if they understand what, what their, what their ability is per se at the same time, which comes back to how you coach things. Um, but I think it all comes back to doing, doing the basic things really well um, and, and not getting caught up in doing like six or seven things in the 30 or 40 minutes you have, but doing like the two or three things that are going to be really, really well. Um, and if you have time to do the sub supplementary stuff, that's great but at least do the things that you know are going to be most relevant or have the greatest return on investment, but then also understand the programming side of things in terms of, Oh, if this person, if we're trying to drive this adaptation, what do I need to do in terms of a total weekly scheme to get what I need to get to? So I think I just see a lot of, a lot of stuff where it's just, we're, we're throwing too much at someone and they can do it, but I don't think they're getting the best out of it. Um, and I, I'm not, I'm just not sure of the capacity and task if that's really holding up like you want it to. So that's something that I've been kind of experimenting with and I'll be playing with um, the, the time to come. Um, I'd really like to get a, a force plate system in, in the clinic and be able to test some of, some of those thoughts, but um, hopefully be able to do that here soon. But um, yeah, go for your low hanging fruits. That was something I was told in school. Um, so I went to, I was fortunate enough to go to Duke and I had a professor named uh, Dr. Mike Raymond. So uh, he was very big on this idea of um, do the basics very, very well. And uh, when I was in DPT school, I was like, what do you mean, man? Like, what, what in the world are you talking about? Do the basics very well. Um, and as I'm, as I'm going more and more into practice, I'm starting to kind of appreciate that more. Like, it's, it's funny when I started practicing, you know, my session would look like four to six things. Now my sessions now look like two to three things, right? Because um, A, I know that's going to give me the greatest return on investment, but also the person's probably going to, we know this from a research perspective, but people are probably going to be a little bit more compliant if we give that to them from a home exercise standpoint to do the, the little things that are going to have the greatest return on investment as opposed to giving them five or six and they're just going to be like, I don't know what to do, right? Um, so that's what I would what I would say. That would be my advice. Yeah, that's awesome. A lot of good takeaways there. So last question, we've been asking all of our guests, you're our second one. So we're going to keep this question up. How do you stay up to date on the literature? Obviously you read a lot of research and you post a lot of stuff. So how do you keep up with all of it? 
Yeah. So first thing I'm going to give my, uh, give my own uh, page, page a shout out. So evidence-based movement, if you're not following them, check them out. Um, oh. page, page I've been running for since I was in DPT school. So I uh, was fortunate enough to have four guys on the team and that's definitely a way that I stay up to date with it. Um, I didn't realize how, how valuable Twitter is um, until about a year ago, like basically around the pandemic. So that has been a huge learning, um, learning kind of platform for me um, that I've taken a lot away from there. Um, so that's been a huge thing and just kind of following people that kind of fit your interest. Um, and then I just, I like to do things as well. I've, I've, I set it up on my, um, my weekly email on Sundays. I actually get in the mornings. Um, I get like a, from PubMed. It's just like, I do, so I do like ACR reconstruction, but also return to sports stuff. So I just get kind of my weekly update. Um, I kind of sift through the things and kind of say like, oh, this is interesting. Let me kind of read this real quick and kind of put it there. So um, again, you're not going to be able to read everything, but um, I think it's just trying to um, stay on top of literature from that perspective, but also um, just kind of follow people that um, they can kind of give clinical experience as well. I feel like that's where I've, I've gained a lot of, um, a lot of experiences, not so much from a research perspective, but people kind of giving their input that have um, kind of been in the trenches and done that stuff. So um, whether it's from strength and conditioning or it's been from the, the rehab side of things, that's been super helpful as well to kind of get their input and kind of test it in clinic as well. So um, those are kind of things that I've found to be super beneficial um, staying on top of things. And also just, you know, just connecting with like-minded people, right? I think when you, when you, um, you have kind of communi- uh, communication and conversations with people, um, you know, that obviously drives something important. So that's something that I'm, that I'm personally trying to kind of get more out of is just trying to kind of figure out people that are kind of along the, the, the same train of thought as me um, and try to have more open conversations like this. So I appreciate you guys having me on here. It was definitely a lot of fun to talk about this. I know I probably talked to y'all's head off, but it was fun to do it. No, I definitely learned a lot. And I, I'm going to take a lot away from this and have a lot more reading to do in terms of uh, catching up with you. So uh, looking forward to that. Sure. And if any of our listeners have questions for you or if they want to get in contact with you, what are the best ways that they can do that? Yeah. So, um, I think Twitter and, uh, obviously Instagram are probably the best places to reach out to me. Um, always kind of on there. So, um, Twitter is just Madison Frannick. So it's my name. And then Instagram is, I think it's Dr. Madison Frannick, um, on there or something like that. Um, also if anyone ever wants to send me an email, it's just Madison Frannick at Gmail. And I'll kind of send that guys to you if you have a, a description or something you kind of put in there. So I'm um, just Madison Frannick at Gmail is kind of my, my personal email. So, um, I'm always willing to answer questions and talk to people if they have any, anything they want to talk about. We'll link all that on the show notes and the website. So we appreciate you having or having you on yeah. and, uh, <laughs> looking forward to our next chat. Yeah. Sounds good. Thanks guys. I appreciate yeah. it. All right. Thanks for listening to the athletes performance podcast. If you have any questions regarding this episode or future episodes, please be sure to reach out on social media or our website.